everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's online talk, which will be starting shortly at 3 p.m. For those of you who are here early, thank you for waiting patiently. While you're waiting, we would like to share with you a short video from the firm. I founded the firm in September 1985 with the vision of seeking truth and justice for our clients and not just winning their cases. Over the years, the team has achieved many significant milestones. We are today recognized by the Legal 500, Asia Law Profiles, and Asian Legal Business as a recommended firm in various practice areas. While we have embraced technology to make our services efficient and responsive, we continue to grow on a bedrock of meticulous preparation and hard work, for which there is really no substitute. As legal practice becomes increasingly international, we keep ourselves ahead of the curve with our relationship with lawyers from around the world. Our firm is a founding member of the Legal Lawyers, a growing international network of law firms in 20 Asian and European countries. We believe in partnering with our clients to protect and grow their business. We achieve this by holding firm to our values of integrity and justice while giving our best to deliver effective and efficient solutions. Instead of just legal services, we focus on developing great working relationships based on understanding and respect. The firm invests in its team and emphasizes professional development. We are keen to share our knowledge and publish our articles on our website. And we also give back with our corporate social responsibility activities. We cultivate a passion for the law and enjoy what we do. This brings out the best in us for our clients today and tomorrow. We regularly advise foreign clients, including many Chinese investors, and have a ready appreciation for different ways of doing business. In corporate matters, we offer relevant and commercial solutions, often raising issues that clients may or may not have realized before. In negotiations, we believe in facilitating win-win outcomes. Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us for today's online talk on reporting institutions and reporting obligations under the Anti-Money Laundering, Anti-Terrorism Financing and Proceeds of Unlawful Activities Act 20, uh, 2001. My name is Suen. I'm an associate with Mao Ying and Associates. Due to unforeseen circumstances, Ms. Felicia is unable to be our speaker today. Instead, Ms. Cassandra will be joining us today as a speaker and I will be your moderator for today's session. Before we start today's session, allow me to introduce the firm and what we do. Mao Ying Kuan Associate is a mid-sized law firm that was founded in 1985 by Datuk Mao Ying Kuan. Our ABLE team today comprises of 23 lawyers and a support team of 19. Datuk Mao is today a consultant with the firm following his retirement from the Court of Appeal bench in 2015. The firm continues its tradition today of working primarily with small medium enterprises, family businesses and individuals. We are a full-service law firm with a corporate department, a dispute resolution department, including litigation, adjudication, and arbitration, a dedicated employment department, and a department focused on servicing the needs of individuals and families. Our practice groups indicate some of our focus areas, which are supported by talents from both our corporate and dispute resolution teams. This talk is part of our MWKA online talk series. By way of background, we have been organizing monthly lunch talks at our office since 2013, some of which were also broadcasted live. But with the COVID-19 Movement Control Order, or MCO, we have moved online in order to continue with our objective of sharing knowledge, raising awareness, and encouraging networking for clients, potential clients, and in-house counsels. This is the 31st talk in our MWKA online talk series. Please feel free to visit our website at maoinkwai.com for more information, to read our articles and to sign up for more upcoming talks. Before I continue, please be reminded that this talk does not constitute a legal advice. In the event you require specific legal advice to your matter, please contact us for a complimentary legal consultation. Details will be given at the end of this talk. Now, allow me to introduce both our speakers for today. Firstly, Ms. Cassandra Slomazio, a partner in our corporate department. She holds a Bachelor of Laws from Northumbria University 
and a Master's of Laws in Transnational Law from King's College London. Cassandra was called to the Bar of England and Wales in a temple in 2011, and she was admitted to the Nation Bar in 2012. Cassandra's primary areas of practice include corporate and commercial matters, drafting corporate project agreements, and m and and m and transactions. Next, we have Mr. Tommy Wong. He is an associate in our corporate department, and he will be our first speaker for today. Tommy holds a Bachelor of Law from University of Hertfordshire. He was called to the Bar of England and Wales, Lincoln Inn, in 2017, and was admitted to the Malaysian Bar in 2019. Tommy's primary areas of practice include commercial and corporate matters, drafting corporate project agreements, franchise and licensing agreements, advising on regulatory compliance, and M&A transactions. All speakers hope to complete today's talk by 3.45 p.m. and thereafter proceeds with a Q&A session. So if you have any questions, please don't forget to post them up on Slido and our speakers will address them later. You should have received a link to Slido during registration, but I will leave this slide up for a while so that you can scan the QR code before we move on. Alternatively, you can go to Slido's key page, our web page and key in the code 58513. I repeat, 58513. Here are our top points for today. During this talk, our speakers will explain the obligations imposed by AMLA 2001. Tommy will start things off by explaining what amounts to money laundering and terrorism financing. He will also explain what falls within the ambit of reporting institutions and what are their reporting obligations. Later, Cassandra, our second speaker, will explain what amounts to a tr suspicious transaction and what to do in the event there is a suspicious transaction. With that said, I will now invite Tommy to share his insights. Over to you, Tommy. Thank you, Sue Anne. Uh, my name is Tommy. Uh, I am an, an associate with the corporate department. Now, today's talk, we are looking to get into what money laundering is, uh, what co constitutes terrorism financing, and also the use of, uh, well, we call it unlaw uh, proceeds from unlawful activities. In layman's terms, we call it dirty money. So uh, this talk basically will uh, give you an introductory and general insight into the laws surround surrounding this uh, area, uh, and also, uh, who uh, has obligations to report to uh, the competent authority in Malaysia, which is uh, Bank Negara Malaysia, for any uh, suspicious transactions that are uh, conducted via their companies, partnerships, or legal arrangements whatsoever. Uh, to start off, uh, money laundering well, has been defined as where cash proceeds originating from an unlawful activity are received and then converted for the purpose of disguising its illegal source and then thereafter disguising it as cash from legitimate activity or business. Now, the process for money laundering has uh, three stages. You've got placement, layering and integration. Physical placement of uh, the, these dirty money, uh, basically, it is it can be conducted via deposits into uh, bank accounts. Uh, so basically it's the first step to disguising that illegal uh, audit trail of such dirty money. Then you've got layering uh, where they've said that it is the separation of these dirty money from their source through uh, transactions that will disguise or conceal the audit trail. Now, layering basically is to complicate uh, the entire tracing of uh, these dirty monies that they are intending to use. Uh, what, how, 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 how these uh, tracings can, or tra audit trails can be complicated is by, well, uh, separation of uh, deposits into smaller transactions or uh, multiple uh, repeated invoicing or even multiple tra bank transfers to another account. Lastly, you've got integration. Uh, basically, it is uh, after going through stages one and two, integration is where these well, offenders uh, bring in, integrate and use the converted dirty money in the economy. Sec uh, to the second part of uh, today's talk is also terrorism financing. 
Well, yeah, the act, the provision says uh, that terrorism financing is where any person provides any sort of uh, support to fund terrorist uh, terrorist organizations or even terrorism uh, terrorist activities uh, for the, for the purposes of such terrorist or organizations or uh, people to carry out uh, terrorist acts. Uh, well, while the while the off offense of money laundering takes uh, into account the source of the money, uh, on the other hand, terrorism financing uh, this offense does not uh, give any sort of regard to whether the, the the money being used to finance the act is legitimate or illegit illegitimate. That that's because uh, well, it is terrorism anyway. Now, um, in the act, uh, acts of terrorism has been defined as offenses that are listed under various sections in of the penal code. Now, here I've set up uh, all of them, uh, section one one thirty and section one thirty o. So these are two of the acts of terrorism listed in the penal code, and you've got the next slide. Uh, being 130p, 130q. Uh, basically, uh, well, the acts of terror, but well, in any in any regard, uh, money, any any form of money is being used to fund or finance or facilitate any a, anything that has to do with uh, uh, terrorist activities. Now, unlawful and illegal proceeds. Well, again, uh, layman's terms, it is known as uh, dirty money. So what constitutes to being uh, defined as dirty money? Well, any property derived or obtained, whether directly or indirectly by any person as a result of any unlawful activity. Now, unlawful activities are all set out in uh, the provision of uh, AMLA 2001. Uh, and in the slide, I've set out uh, a very, 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 very short list of uh, offenses that uh, where, wherein monies that are coming out from such offenses are, con are, are considered as dirty money. Uh, we've got money laundering, uh, export of import of, and trafficking in dangerous drugs, uh, even carrying business as a money lender without any license. Also, yeah, it, it, it is a serious offense that any monies that come out from it will be considered dirty money. Now, since uh, all over the world, uh, illegal proceeds have been, well, commonly used in the economy, uh, the Financial Action Task Force is, it is the international, sets the international standards uh, against uh, money laundering and terrorist financing. And it also promotes effective measures to combat money laundering and terrorism financing. Uh, well, for, for the college shot, uh, FATF incorporates uh, key principles from the UNSCRs in developing uh, these standards against uh, money laundering and terrorism financing. Uh, they've taken for, uh, principles out of, for example, the Vienna Convention and uh, the Palermo Convention, amongst others. So, that being said, for the international standards in Malaysia, uh, we have come up with a comprehensive framework for anti-money laundering and countering of terrorist financing. And that is the primary legislation of the Anti-Money Laundering, Anti-Terrorism Financing and Proceeds of Unlawful Activities Act 2001. The objective of this uh, primary legislation is to prevent and combat uh, some offenses and also the use of illegal monies and the integration of such of the same in, in our economy. Now, well, uh, even though this is the primary legislation, uh, Bank Negara has released a lot, a lot of policy documents. Uh, previously, previously, uh, they have released sectoral guidelines for each individual sector uh, for reporting institutions to abide by, but well, they have come up with policy documents to make things clearer to guide reporting institutions as to their reporting obligations under this act. Uh, you've got uh, 
the policy documents for financial institutions. You've got uh, policy documents for designated non-financial businesses and professions, and also non-banking financial institutions. Uh, also, for digital currencies, that is uh, cryptocurrency or you know uh, companies that deal with uh, virtual currencies, they still follow by the sectoral guidelines under sector sector six. Uh, released by the uh, competent authority previously. So, well, uh, money laundering and terrorism financing is that both offenses are considered very, very grave. And the impact of such offenses on each, each country itself, uh, well, increase in crime rates that could threaten national security and so and so. Uh, so in order to curb such risk, we have preventive measures in place to go against uh, the continuous form of such offenses uh, that are to take place or that continuously take that are continuously taking place uh, in each country. So uh, for today's talk, uh, after all the introduction of money laundering and terrorism financing, uh, as we said, uh, we go into reporting institutions under uh, the Act. So these reporting institutions are required by law to undertake uh, measures to prevent their institutions from being used as a conduit for uh, such activities, uh, money laundering and terrorism financing. Now these measures are termed as reporting obligations under AMLA 2001. Uh, I, I, I understand that, well, Having, well, be, having the, the, the term money laundering and terrorism financing and reporting institutions and obligations under the Act uh, perhaps may raise your attention as to whether or not uh, your company or partnership uh, is within the ambit of uh, these reporting institutions. Well, uh, AMLA has set out a, a very, very fine list of uh, who falls within the ambit of reporting institutions. Now, re before we go on, uh, reporting institutions are actually basically defined as any person, including branches or sub subsidiaries outside Malaysia of that person who, carry up, who carries on any activity listed in the first schedule of the Act. Now, when you go uh, to the Bank, Bank Nagara Malaysia's uh, website, and uh, in relation to obviously uh, anti-money laundering and anti-terrorism financing, they have set up uh, the different sectors wherein uh, different reporting institutions are, are, are listed. Now, uh, in the first schedule of the Act, you have a very, very extensive list of who falls or who is a reporting institution under the Act, but BNM has set things out more uh, conveniently for the public to understand. Now, BNM has provided eight different sectors. You've got banking, the insurance, money services, business, electronic money, uh, capital market, development, financial institutions, other financial institutions, and also the DNFBPs, uh, who include, which includes, uh, well, accountants, lawyers, and, and so on and so forth. I've listed, I've listed uh, the full list provided by Bank Nagar in Asia in the following slides, as you can see, under banking, insurance, uh, money services, business, well, you've got commercial Islamic banks, investment banks, uh, you've got life insurance companies, family takafu companies, money changes, uh, remittance service providers, wholesale money changing operators for money services business. In the capital market sector, you've got derivatives bro brokers, fund management companies, Laban fund, man fund managers, listing sponsors, trading agents. For development financial institutions, these are financial institutions well, towards uh, big developments as well. So you've got Agrobank, uh, uh, Bank Sipana National. And well, okay, here are more towards the non-financial uh, institutions uh, who are reporting institutions. You've got accountants. Casinos are also uh, categorized as 
the reporting institution. Company secretaries, oh, I was surprised there as well. Uh, lawyers, notaries public, pawnbrokers, public trust companies, even res registered estate agents and trust companies. Other financial institutions, including uh, Tambaga Tabung Haji, uh, MBSB, money lenders, and even post Malaysia Berha uh, have uh, reporting obligations as reporting institutions under the Act. So, what are ob reporting obligations un under AMLA? Well, these are duties for reporting institutions to report uh, or to keep. Uh, well, to, to, to monitor uh, a business transaction with its customers uh, throughout the business transaction. Now, such obligations can be divided into customer due diligence. Uh, you've got risk management, risk profiling. You've also got record keeping and the retention of such records, uh, compliance programs within the institution, and also uh, the procedure for reporting suspicious transactions and only for, for, for certain uh, reporting institutions uh, you've got the cash threshold report obligation as well. Now, cus customer due diligence uh, to begin with, uh, what is it? It is to basically identify uh, the client or the customer uh, for uh, on its on his or her or, or on their uh, origin, their background, uh, representative capacity, occupation, business purpose, and also the business transaction that they are intending to undertake. Thereafter, getting all this information, uh, reporting institutions are supposed to verify these uh, such information and also uh, to keep a record of this information uh, collected throughout the business transaction. Now we'll go uh, deeper into it uh, in the following slides. Now, for individuals uh, to get the information out of them, well, basically, it's a very basic uh, pro uh, procedure. Get their full name, uh, IC number or passport number, uh, residential address, mailing address, uh, their date of birth, nationality, uh, you've got the, uh, the purpose of the transaction to be undertaken, uh, occupation, uh, if they're self-employed, the nature of their self-employment, uh, also if they're employed by an employer, the name of the employer, contact number, and for corporate or legal persons rather, uh, get their name, company registration number, or business registration number, you've got their registered address, business address, nature of business, uh, again, the purpose of transaction. Uh, who and also, I, I would say, uh, do get the information on the person who is authorized to represent uh, the legal, the corporate customer, rather. Uh, and, and well, that is for your verification towards the latter stages of the procedure. Oops, sorry. Uh, well, yeah, verification. Uh, okay, once you've gotten or obtain such information, the next step is to basically verify it because we can't just uh, take the customer's word for, for it, right? Uh, well, they can provide us the, the information, the names, passports, or whatever, whatsoever. Uh, we have to take steps. Uh, reporting of institutions have to take uh, steps to verify uh, the authenticity of uh, the information given. So how, how, how to first uh, conduct the verification procedure? Perhaps uh, you could ask them for a copy of their IC. Uh, you can, uh, for individuals uh, in this regard, uh, uh, pho photographic documentary evidence uh, to put it in as a collective. So you've got, uh, uh, you've got the certified true copy of your IC or passport uh, or even driver's license now, this, these uh, evidence, documentary, photographic documentary evidence will provide you with the relevant information that uh, is required to verify whatever information that the customer has given you. Uh, if for individuals, uh, there's a mismatch between 
the information given and the information uh, collected or, or, or found uh, or discovered during the verification process, uh, reporting institutions can then ask for uh, non-photographic documentary evidence such as uh, birth certificate uh, or even utility bills or bank statements to you know, verify the entire uh, customer due diligence information required. For legal persons like companies, partnerships, uh, you can verify uh, the information obtained by conducting a simple SSM search, CTOS search, or even winding up search. Uh, furthermore, you can even ask the, the, the customer for, uh, well, the company's constitution, certificate of incorporation, uh, certificate of business registration. Uh, you've got also perhaps director's resolution, uh, shareholders agreement, uh, if the customer is willing to give it to you. Uh, well, these are information and documents that are required for uh, reporting institutions to have before commencing a business transaction. Now, customer due diligence is a very, very uh, sensitive area because, uh, well, before, be generally speaking, before a business relationship is uh, established, um, not many customers would really want to, you know, uh, provide such sensitive information uh, to, uh, you know, the person, the, 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 the site who's requesting for such information. But well, if they have valid reasons for, for, for not wanting to give, then, well, I guess that's, a, well, not I guess, but it is okay. Uh, but if uh, they have no valid reasons, so or they, they, they always seem to dodge face-to-face uh, -face meetings, even if they're like nearby, or they constantly disregard uh, giving information about themselves for, for, for verification purposes, then well, that would raise a red flag uh, for a report. Now, red flags and re re reports being made will be touched on later uh, during the talk. Uh, for now, we go on to, well, we continue with customer due diligence, sorry. Um, also, once the information has been obtained, verified, we, uh, we reporting institutions have to screen the names against uh, a, lot of, a lot of lists, to be honest. You've got the sanctions list for terrorism, pro proliferation, and other United Nations sanctions regimes. Now, in, if the screening is in the positive, then, well, uh, it is definitely a red flag. Uh, then you have reporting institutions are advised to block transactions being made and also to reject establishing the business relationship with the customer. In addition to that, you, reporting institutions also have to do conduct risk profiling, such as the customer's risk, uh, lo the location or the origin of business, or the country of origins, or country of origin of uh, the customers, and also the, the, the nature and type of product services transactions being undertaken in uh, the, the business transaction for and on behalf of the customer. Now, these are very important to, to keep in mind. Now, before we go on to uh, ongoing customer due diligence, uh, well, for customer due diligence, the standard one, the standard procedure, well, it is important that uh, before establishing a business relationship, you uh, reporting institutions are certain the uh, reporting institutions are sure that the person who is in front of them uh, in pro giving instructions or making inquiries to uh, conduct a transaction with the reporting institution is uh, is the actual person that they're actually uh, you know uh, uh, doing a business with now for example if let's say uh, the person's name is John Smith, uh, but he is more commonly known commonly known as uh, John John Doe John Doe or Doe Smith. Uh, he's not allowed. Such customer is not allowed to provide his aliases 
to open an account or to establish a business relationship under uh, those aliases, he must provide his actual name verified by uh, the name the, the, the name that is stated in his docu uh, documentary evidence and uh, basically don't get, uh, well the advice is do not get into uh, a transaction or relationship with a person who does not seem who doesn't seem to be who he is uh, so once after customer due diligence is conducted satisfactorily uh, to the standards of the uh, procedures uh, in-house procedures of the reporting institutions then that reporting institution can uh, provide uh, can, can commence business relationship with the customer as for ongoing due diligence you've got uh, well the, the the documents that have been obtained that has been kept on record uh, in regards to the relevant customer now throughout that business relationship reporting institutions are to continuously conduct due diligence on the customer. Well, uh, I've come across that it is not necessarily required for one off customer uh, who is transacting for a short period of time, but it would be best to, 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 to keep on verifying uh, uh, the information that you have on record uh, throughout the business relationship from start to end. Now, ongoing due diligence uh, when it's conducted it is to be conducted on all accounts, uh, business relationships, transactions and activities. Uh, you've got two ways to conduct it uh, as listed on the, on the slides. You've got transaction monitoring. Uh, so it is conducted by scrutinizing transactions to ensure the consistency with the customer's profile on record or to scrutinize the transaction at a frequency that commensurate with the customer's risk level and to select patterns of transactions that need further examination. Now, just because uh, the standard customer due diligence procedure is, is satisfied, does not mean that at a later stage in the business transaction, uh, they might not be up to some dodgy activities. So it is, the responsibility of reporting institutions to continuously conduct uh, ongoing customer due diligence. Uh, this is more com commonly done so when or if uh, throughout the duration of the business transaction, uh, at any stage, the, the purpose of the transaction or the eco economic background of the customer appears unusual, uh, well, does not have any apparent economic purpose then that's where the procedure takes place and then proce procedure goes on and on and on again until doubts are, uh, are cast away and there's no longer a gray cloud above their heads now, enhanced customer due diligence uh well this is basically uh, multiple steps higher than the standard customer due diligence um uh, it it well it brings into regard uh, the, the information that you have collected during the standard uh, due diligence procedure and where it is not exactly satisfactory uh, after a while or after, at a later stage in the business transaction or for example during the business relationship uh, suddenly red flags are popping up here and there say hey this is that doesn't really make sense. This is a bit, you know, eh. Then obviously, uh, it, 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 well, you'll be on, the reporting institution will be on alert. Now, when there is such reflex popping up every now and then during the, the business relationship, then obviously what has to be done? It is not just ongoing customer due diligence. You, you've got to uh, conduct enhanced customer due diligence by requesting additional information from the customer or from available public sources. Now, uh, such information includes volumes, volume of assets, 
source of funds uh, or source of wealth. Um, and this, uh, even, even, even if, let's say, uh, after the enhanced customer due diligence procedure is conducted on the customer, uh, it is not necessary that, oh, uh, yeah, business transaction can commence, uh, recommence or resume as usual, or we can actually establish the relationship with the customer straight away. Uh, when the customer or a client is, has been subject to enhanced CDD, uh, and even though it's satisfied, the reporting institution has to get uh, written approval from their top management for the go ahead for uh, to establish a business transaction. Uh, customers who are subject to enhanced due diligence, uh, enhanced due, customer due diligence it includes customers who are from uh, countries who are listed in the in the in the sanctions list, uh, uh, politically exposed persons, uh, either local or, or, or foreign. Uh, you've got cash-based business, uh, individuals with uh, a high net worth, uh, and even uh, customers in unregulated industries. Now, for uh, politically exposed persons, uh, during the enhanced due diligence uh, procedure, it is absolutely fundamental and vital that uh, reporting institutions keep in mind that their source of funds and their, and their source of wealth both are uh, obtained from uh, the client and also to, to be verified by the reporting institutions as well. Uh, for, well, countries in the sanctions list where uh, the Financial Action Task Force has provided uh, that there are two separate lists. You've got, uh, well, we call it subject to call, call for action, and you've got the list for increased monitoring. Uh, countries that are listed in uh, the subject to call for action list, uh, there, are, there are only two countries right now. Uh, they are the Democratic People's Republic of Korea and also Iran. Uh, I've got a quite a list for, for countries who are in the increased monitoring list. They include, uh, well, Albania, Cambodia, Ghana, Jamaica, uh, Mauritius, Myanmar, and Pakistan. Now, what is the significance of the list? When the countries are, or when the country is subject to it is listed in the subject to call for action list, but well, they are automatically uh, due for enhanced customer due diligence by the reporting institution. For the countries listed in the incre increased monitoring list, they are, well, reporting institutions have to pay uh, extra attention uh, to the customers from such countries to say the least. Uh, in, in summary, uh, customer due diligence is to be conducted on new customers when establishing a business relationship or during an onboarding of a customer. And in, in the case of existing customers, uh, uh, it is to be conducted on the basis of materiality and risk. So when uh, the risk or the business relationship or nature of it changes or where red flags, suspicions all start popping up, then it's where uh, enhanced due diligence come into play as well. Uh, even for existing customers, if you have never previously conducted customer due diligence, uh, you are to start, you know, to conduct, uh, to get information to verify so that you've got all this documentation and information in uh, on record so that, you know, you keep yourself safe. Uh, well, where customers do not uh, want to provide uh, these information uh, or documents for the reporting institutions' uh, respective uh, methods or procedures for customer due diligence and 
therefore rendering the customer due diligence procedure to be incomplete, then uh, the, the reporting institutions are advised to not open any account or to commence any bits of business relationships with the customer uh, or if to even perform any sort of transactions for and on behalf of the customer. Uh, otherwise, uh, if there's a delay in verifying the information or documentation obtained from customers, uh, well, delay is allowed, but subject to certain uh, circumstances. Uh, but as long as you know the delay can be remedied or rectified within 10 working days, uh, the reporting institution is on the clear. Well, even though uh, previously uh, the previous slides have listed uh, the amount, the, the the list of reporting institutions uh, by or rather set up by BNM, or if you have actually seen the first schedule of AMLA 2001 with the full extensive list of uh, reporting institutions. Uh, well, th these or those uh, reporting institutions have reporting uh, obligations on them, imposed on them. Now, if let's say your company or partnership is not listed uh, within the, 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 the list, uh, you, you, you don't have reporting obligations on you, but uh, you are advised to, prov uh, to provide uh, in information uh, or documentation to assist in that investigations uh, to BNM uh, in the event your com such company or partnerships who are not listed in the list have any uh, information or uh, background details as to suspicious transaction activities. Now, as I've mentioned previously, if and when when red flags pop up, uh, well, suspicious transactions may be, may be in the books, but uh, I have not previously touched on, uh, or on, on, on these two extensively, which is why I will hand the floor over to Cassandra to further elaborate on these two topics. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tommy. That was very insightful. And thanks very much, Suen, as well, for the introduction earlier. Um, so I'm supposed to proceed with red flag criteria and go through that. But before we do that, I just wanted to go back to uh, Tommy's previous slides, which was screening in relation to customer due diligence, uh, where he has referred to a list of sanctions, of, um, the, which provides a list of countries, really, and high risk countries as well. Now, to find these lists where it refers to risk profiling and screening, as earlier mentioned, one thing that you can do in order to do your enhanced customer due diligence is I will show all of you. So just bear with me for a second. Here, um, hopefully if you can see, you have the Bank Nagara website, which I've gone to. All you need to type is, essentially if you're on Google, you just type in Bank Nagara. On top in the home screen, you'll be able to check all the different various types of rules and regulations on their website. Now, at the moment, I have category, categories on my left-hand side, if you can see. It has sanctions related to terrorism. Um, now, that's a list of countries as well. You have country-related sanctions, and you also have dealings with high-risk countries. And I believe this is the one that Tommy has read out earlier. And if you click on the latest circular, they will always have their updated circulars um, depending on the year. So I've gone ahead and clicked 2020, and you will see that there are various jurisdictions with strategic defici deficiencies, which Bank Nagara has pointed out. And this is considered jurisdictions which are under increased monitoring and these are the countries, as Tommy indicated earlier, that you can cross-check and see if you have any clients or if you have any monies or bank accounts from monies coming from any of these countries that you need to be aware of. So when you're doing your customer due diligence, if you need to, the Bank Nagara website is always there for you to check. And of course, you can go to the different country-related sanctions or um, high-risk profile countries, which you are referring to. As, as he said earlier, it was Iran and Korea for proliferation of weapons and mass destruction. And it should be included in your hands due diligence as a red flag, which we will go into now, if any of those countries, uh, if your clients are from any of those countries. 
to start with the red flag criteria, uh, this is a trigger which Bank Nicara has highlighted that requires the submission of something called a suspicious transaction report. Now, reporting institutions are required to establish their own internal criteria. Some big companies, especially bigger organizations, how they wish to do it is they usually create an internal policy of what exactly a red flag criteria would be within that organization. The, de the dependency on how much of internal policies is required depends on how big your corporate organization is or it depends the sum of monies that you are receiving, whether it's in a high volume or not. This will essentially assist the reporting institution if of course that corporate organization is in fact a reporting institution. In considering whether or not a red flag criteria would be uh, a requirement for them to submit a suspicious transaction report, if any of their transactions or attempted transaction fits their red flag criteria. Now, there are several trigger points for a red flag criteria. There are a few examples which we have set out here for you. However, please be informed that this is not comprehensive and the definition of a red flag criteria is not comprehensively de uh, defined by Bank Negara. However, uh, a few examples would be transactions which are conducted in a questionable manner or if there are doubts that you have with a particular customer which you can't answer or the customer itself can't answer. There are also customers who may demonstrate a long period of inactivity. The example of this is an incorporation of a company which has essentially been inactive for several years. Um, again, the definition of several years is not defined, but it could be two years, it could be five years, it could be 10 years, and all of a sudden there is an unexplained amount of activity within that dormant company, and there's a movement of monies going in and out. That is essentially considered a red flag. Um, another, opportun another example of red flags would be in the real estate industry, where you have a purchase of property and uh, a lot of the time you have foreign clients from overseas that have not even viewed the property. They don't know much about the property. There's no logical explanation to the purchase of the property. However, money is being um, dangled, so you say, uh, to purchase the property. Now, in certain circumstances like this, it might highlight a red flag and due diligence needs to be done on the purchaser and especially where monies are coming from. Countries, again, needs to be sifted out. So you need to go to the Bank Nagara website. You need to have a look at the risk of high risk countries um, and the profiling uh, set out on Bank Nagara to see whether your customer or the purchaser is from either one of these countries or if they're transferring money from a bank account in these countries as well. Other examples would also include uh, reluctance from any of your customers where they have been uh, asked to provide their ICs, a copy of their passport, or any other information as to where monies have come from if they're paying you for a certain amount. It could be payment of a small amount or it could be payment of a big amount. Um, however, when someone is paying you and if you are in an organization which is a reporting, organi uh, reporting institution, you should always ensure that all your information like what Tommy has set out earlier in your customer due diligence has been obtained, including documents. Uh, we have had this as well uh, as a law firm because we are a reporting institution where there is a lack of documents being provided by the customer and their reluctance to pro provide such information to us may be perceived as a red flag. Other examples include frequent transactions of large cash amounts that do not appear to be justified by the customer's business activity. A clear example is, of this is where the customer's business activity involves real estate and monies are coming from another company which is not in the industry of real estate. Now, this is also a red flag, especially if money is being transferred from offshore accounts, which is not related to the nature of their business. Making payments in one form or rather, uh, this is very common where they may make payment for one uh, in one particular, either one particular currency or they may make payment in the form of cash and thereafter request for a refund of payment in a different form of manner. This too may be a red flag criteria which needs to be sifted out depending on the organization that you're in. And of course, last but not least, like what I showed you earlier, a red flag criteria involves any of the domicile, uh, any person domiciled in any of the countries or jurisdictions which the Financial Action ta Task Force has caused for, called for countermeasures. And that can be found on the list uh, under the Bank Negara website, as uh, I've shown you earlier. 
okay, so how do you report uh, a red flag and how do you go about suspicious transaction reports? A way to do this is there is a form on Bank Nicara's website and you need to do this if any transaction or attempted transaction, even if that transaction has failed, appears one, either unusual, two, it has no clear economic purpose. Uh, a clear example of this is where monies are being deposited into your bank account or your company's bank account and you're not sure what they're for or it clearly appears illegal. To be considered for any of this, the submission um, of uh, the criteria of having to conduct the customer due diligence process is necessary and you have had, you should have had done the CDD process before. And then an internal red flag criteria will be triggered if it fails the CDD process. And thereafter, you are required to submit uh, a suspicious transaction report to the Financial Intelligence Unit, which we call FIU in short, uh, in the event of any suspicious transactions. There is a form which I will show you in the next slide, which is a standard form that Bank Megara has prepared. Uh, before you do this steps, um, you must also ensure that any senior management level officer in the company has been appointed as a compliance officer. And this compliance officer is usually the one who will uh, be submitting your SDRs, which is a suspicious transaction report, and who will be the one who has reviewed the red flag criteria. And upon their confirmation, they are the ones, uh, this compliance officer will be the one submitting the suspicious transaction report. Uh, it must be highlighted that time is of the essence here. Uh, su submitting these kind of reports must be done quite quickly, and it should be done usually in a matter of days. This is an example of the Bank Nagara's uh, SDR report, which is to be filled out. You can do it online and you can get a copy on the Bank Nagara website as well. Uh, and it's shown here for convenience sake, but I think it might be a bit small for everyone to see. Now, in relation to SDRs, reporting institutions must provide the required and relevant information as seen in the forms that you can find online. They must establish a reporting system for the submission of these reports and their compliance officer must be able to know how to submit their uh, form. And of course, in the first place, the compliance officer must be appointed. Uh, different organizations have different methods of nominating their own compliance officers. Most of the time, it is one of their, it's a person or an officer as a senior management level in their finance department because they would have the know-how of monies going in and out. Uh, and that is to be submitted to Bank Nagara Malaysia in a very specific uh, manner, which if I'm not mistaken, is also set out at the bottom of this report. And upon approval, whether your compliance officer has been nominated and appointed, they will be officially assigned as your compliance officer. And each compliance officer in a company or an organization will be given a CO number. This is the manner in which a compliance officer is required to submit a suspicious transaction report. You can either send it by mail, fax or email, and the submission must be done directly to Bank Nagara Malaysia. Uh, once an SDR report has been submitted, it is up to the company, uh, the decision lies with the company to decide whether or not they want to proceed with the business transaction. Uh, whether or not they pursue or continue that such business transaction, with the reported customer, uh, that decision rests solely with the reporting institution. Okay, so now moving on to cash threshold reports. Any cash transactions which exceed 25,000 or any other amount which has uh, been gazetted and advised by Bank Nagara, which involve physical currencies or bear any negotiation instruments, which are financial instru instruments such as withdrawal of cash, exchange of uh, cash instruments, traveler's check, bank drafts, electronic transfers, uh, is a threshold which has been issued by Bank Nagara. However, previously this cash transaction was 50,000 and has now been reduced to 25,000 and it took effect on the 1st of January last year. However, one thing to bear in mind is that these cash threshold are only applicable to the following reporting institutions which you which you effectively see on the screen now. These include banks, uh, investment banks, uh, licensed banks, uh, Bank Simpanan Malaysia, Lembaga Tabung Haji, and all companies which have gaming businesses licenses under the Common Gaming Houses Act. Cash threshold do not apply to all reporting institutions. They, only, they are only applicable to a few. 
And these cash threshold reports depend on whether uh, they are applicable to both single or multiple cash transactions. So an example you see here is that if a deposit of 40,000 is made and a withdrawal of 20,000 is made, this must be aggregated to the amount of 60,000 and must be reported if it exceeds a certain amount. Again, this cash threshold ap applies to uh, the following reporting institutions that you see on the screen. If any of these cash thresholds are exceeded, um, the uh, reporting institutions are obliged to uh, report it and inform uh, the financial intelligence system. Right, so retention of records under customer due diligence, which Tommy has pointed out previously, needs to be retained and kept for a minimum period of at least six years. So if you are accumulating or if part of your CDD includes, which it should, um, copies of ICs, passports, company incorporation documents that reflect the business relationship and the accounts that you have with a particular customer or client, these documents for the purposes of anal analysis or at any point of time when Bank Negara requires it needs to be kept for a minimum of six years. This is also to ensure that all retained documents are recorded so that an audit train trail can be kept for individual transactions. Compliance programs. Now we at obviously our lawyers, we love compliance programs. We have very many different ones, but most reporting institutions should adopt, uh, develop and implement internal programs, policies and procedures. Now you will see that if you just type into Google, a lot of public listed companies have AMLA policies, which you find online and they're very readily available on their websites, especially public listed companies. Um, they set out the establishment and the procedures to ensure high standards of integrity within their employees of the company. And they also include training programs, which they have on a recurring basis. Some companies do it once a year, some companies do it, do it uh, twice a year. And they set out the procedures for know your customer programs and customer due diligence, which all employees are meant to follow. This is serves also as a, a, a form of audit function where they also have their own independent audit to check compliance with such programs as an ongoing basis and to check that they are in compliance with all the AMLA policies that Bank Negara has implemented. Employee training and awareness, of course, is very important for any corporate uh, or large organization. It may, may be small or big, but most compliance programs include AMLA policies where these AMLA policies, one will be reviewed uh, on a periodic basis or two training and awareness will be conducted so that all employees, including senior management are aware of, and they know how to conduct uh, due diligence for uh, money laundering and counter uh, finance terrorism. The purpose of this is so that all employees are aware and that they can be held responsible for failure to observe, observe any of the anti-money laundering or CFT requirements which may be required by that reporting institution. In conclusion, and to sum it all up, because I am wary of the time, uh, with the high awareness of money laundering and terrorism financing risks that come along nowadays, all reporting institutions are expected to adhere to the obligations which I've set out in the past slides that we have discussed and under the AMLA Act 2001. The steps and measures which are taken by Bank Negara is essentially a fight against and for the prevention of money laundering and terrorism financing, which is in accordance to our international standards set by the Financial Action Task Force. It is always good practice for everyone to remember that larger organizations must have internal AMLA policies and smaller organizations who are also reporting institutions should at least have a form of corporate governance framework as to their AMLA policies and regulations. With that, I will conclude and I'll hand it back over to Sue Wen because um, I believe we do have some questions to be answered. Thank you. Thank you, Cassandra. Thank you, Cassandra and Tommy. We will now take questions that some of you have posted on Slido. Remember, you can ask us questions on Slido either by scanning this QR code uh, that's on your left or uh, going to Slido's webpage and key in the code 58513. Now, for the first question, does AMLA policies apply to property agents? Cassandra, can we have your thoughts? 
Thanks, Wen. Yes, so um, as indicated earlier in the slides, uh, AMLA policies do apply to real estate agents. So if you're a registered real estate agent, then you should be abiding with AMLA policies, which in turn means that the real estate agency would be a reporting institution. Okay. Our next question. How is money laundering used to help finance terrorism? Um, Tommy, can we have your thoughts? Um, well, interesting. Uh, money laundering is an offense in itself and terrorist activities, uh, again, they are categorized under the various sections of 130N to 130Q of the penal code. Uh, not necessarily only money laundering can be used to contribute or to finance uh, terrorist activities, even where I'm earning a salary income from a legitimate source. If I have uh, intentions to finance terrorist activities, I can even use my legitimate money uh, to finance such activities, uh, which is why I, I think I mentioned earlier during my presentation that I said that the offense of terrorism financing does not take into account whether or not the money being used to to finance such activities are legitimate or illegitimate. So uh, how is money laundering used to help finance? Well, to make it simple, uh, I would say the easiest way, uh, financing through offshore accounts uh, to just transfer the money, money to the you know, orga terrorist organizations. But yeah, uh, legit or illegitimate uh, monies are both uh, are uh, not taken into consideration uh, as long as you're financing terrorist activities, then it's an offence. Cassandra, do you have anything to add? I do actually, yes. So um, it's very interesting, uh, Leap, as pointed out by Tommy, this is actually quite common. Um, a lot of companies, um, especially a lot of uh, terrorists, I would say, uh, financing for terrorism is done actually to a lot of corporate vehicles and when I mean corporate vehicles I'm referring to uh, like what Tommy said offshore companies especially and you don't only usually find it as a single thread where uh, money is passed by one company and then straight to the terrorist no it actually passed by a series of companies altogether so that it is actually concealed other than, uh, under different businesses um, and that is how the ter terrorism is usually financed our next question um, from Yin, we see DD on corporate customers. Why publicly listed companies are exempted to provide their MOA or AOA? Um, Cassandra, can you take this question? Sure, thanks, Wen. So I think customer due diligence for public listed companies are a lot easier to do because their memorandum of uh, association and their articles of association are usually found online and they're very publicly available. Um, they usually uh, included in their website or if you do a simple SSM search usually their MOA or AOA will usually almost always pop up uh, so it's not that they're exempted to provide it it's just that you, you can find it a lot easier online because they're publicly available documents as compared to a private listed to the company where they are not Thanks Cassandra Moving on to our next question How is money laundering affects the economy? Um, Cassandra, can you please take this again? Okay, so this is a very, uh, thanks, Wen, it's a very interesting question. Um, whoever has asked is actually quite rightly so. Uh, it pops up time and time again, this question, but money laundering essentially affects the economy. One, because at the end of the day, it's a socioeconomic effect. Uh, money laundering could be uh, countered finance terrorism, or it could also mean money is used for drug traffickers, smugglers, uh, other criminals to expand their operations, whatever it may be. This negative socioeconomic effects um, basically the e economy in the country because it essentially is transferring the power that the government has, or it's transferring um, the government's hold in the company, and you're basically transferring it to citizen uh, to criminals, um, and it's it allows criminals to work more freely. So that socioeconomic effect in the country is obviously a negative impact and that obviously negatively impacts the economy. Tommy, do you have anything to add? Uh, well, with the influx of dirty money into the economy, it basically uh, taints 
the integrity and the reputation of businesses uh, in all sectors, even the, especially the financial sector for not being able to, you know, uh, identify and take action against uh, monies that are deri deriving from uh, offenses under uh, the AMLA provision. It, it also, I would say, hinder the growth and competitiveness of the economy, uh, again, due to the influx of uh, legitimate monies being used and not playing by the rules. Would you also say that because um, these are money that uh, they're not they're, they're not declared, so the government will not have information about it, uh, so it affects our government data or like when it comes to collect tax? Well, in a way, but you sort of look at it, uh, let's say, uh, to play by rules, you, you, let's say, for example, uh, uh, opening a bar, uh, you, you you require uh, quite quite a, quite an amount of capital if you want to have it done fancily. Uh, well, first, if let's say we I have a I'm a, I'm an investor, I have a, but my monies have come from illegitimate uh, uh, sources. I have such dirty as uh, money that I have yet to go through the money laundering process. Well, I can first then uh, pump it into the to the to to the to the, the financing of the bar, and then well, more often than not, bars can be also uh, cash-based business, and you know again can be done through repeated invoicing, and that hinders with, with such money coming into power and play uh, in respect to this one bar, and it, it will obviously it will affect the the, the the rest of the the, the food the, the bar industry. So again, uh, the power behind dirty money can hinder uh, the competition within the economy or rather a specific industry. Thank you, Cassandra and Tommy for your answer. Our next question, is there a need for each reporting institution to create a form for the customer or clients to fill in and do report institution include PDBA clauses in form? Um, Tommy, can you take this question? Okay, uh, well, again, uh, I think slides, uh, there was a sample uh, form for suspicious transaction reports, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, there's also a sample set by Bank Nagara Malaysia for customer due diligence. And uh, well, there's no strict rule as to what or what or what can or cannot be included in uh, a reporting institution's uh, own form, but uh, you can uh, you, you can include a PDPA clause in the form if 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 that would help uh, you sort of you know ease the, the the worries on on the customer that's coming towards you for for for, for services. Also, uh, to fill in the form. Whether or not you have to create it, uh, there's no need to create it. It's not a requirement as there's a sample available on VNM's uh, website. So you can actually just, you can actually use it or you can tweak it a little bit uh, here and there. But uh, yeah, as long as you, you, you manage uh, proper documentation, information being kept on record, uh, that, should, that, should, that should satisfy the, the requirements of customer due diligence. Thanks, Tommy. Uh, our next question. Hi, would you recommend using third-party service provider to do PEP screening and sanction lease screening? Uh, Cassandra, uh, what are your thoughts about this? Hmm, this is an interesting question. So I think I would reckon that using a third-party service provider to do your politically exposed person screening and your sanction list screening is becoming increasingly um, common. Uh, there are a couple of uh, clients that we have that outsource their KYC process or their PEP processes to third parties. Um, in fact, there are a lot of online, there are also now a lot of online resources. We have recently come across one which allows you to type in the names of people online and a whole list of the sanctions, if there are any sanctions against them or if there are PEP screening, it allows for PEP screening and sanction list to automatically pop them up as a red flag. 
Uh, you can use these third party service providers. There's nothing stopping you from doing that. However, if you are using a third party service provider to conduct this screening, the evidence of such screening that you have conducted needs to be kept in a, as a, you know, as a form as a, a copy in your file so that you can at least show that the screening has been done. And even though you, um, you know, you engage a third party service provider to do this for you, uh, you still need to have some form of black and white or some form of online verification to show that you have done that. Um, and once that's done, you can feel free to use that third party service provider as long as you have a record of it on file. Thanks, Cassandra. Next. Um, Tommy, do we have to do reporting on CDD on low risk customers? Re reporting of CDD, uh, I, I'm assuming it's either uh, reporting low risk customers for suspicious activities or uh, conducting customer due diligence on low risk customers. Well, either way, uh, all customers must go through uh, customer due diligence, uh, which is to be carried out by all reporting institutions. Whether or not uh, the customers are screened to be low risk or high risk, standard customer due diligence has to be carried out to ascertain the, the identity and to verify the identity, identity of the customer that you're entering into a relationship with. Now, uh, in terms of report, Ting, uh, customers who have been screened or profiled to be low risk for suspicious transactions. Well, yes, it is a must if, let's say, red flags keep popping up throughout your transaction with that low risk customer. Uh, well, as I mentioned earlier, if in the beginning or prior to establishing the business relationship with this customer and upon satisfying customer due diligence and he is found to have to be low risk or no risk for the matter, uh, it can change throughout the course of the relationship. And where red flags again keep popping up uh, here and there, every now and then, uh, doubts are being cast upon the customer and you know, there are gray clouds around him. It is more sensible or advisable for reporting institutions to uh, consider reporting uh, such unusual transactions or red flags or uh, that have been raised by some, the low risk customer that you are uh, dealing with. Thanks, Tommy. Okay, our second last question of the day. In real estate agency, who do we conduct customer due diligence on? Is it on every client who calls out for reviewing or only on those who conclude a transaction? Uh, Cassandra, can you let us have reviews? Sure. So um, thanks for this question. It, uh, your customer due diligence would usually be done on a customer who you have a transaction with. Uh, if it is, say, for example, a new lead where you don't have a transaction or a business relationship at all. So in a real estate agency world, when you are selling a property, in the event someone calls you up for a viewing, which is the example given here, no, you don't have to do your customer due diligence. Your, no, your, your KYCs, and actually the second question comes in together with this, your KYCs and your CDDs usually come in once a transaction has started. So it usually should be on or upon signing of the offer letter or upon execution of the sale and purchase agreement. I'm not sure if Tommy has anything to add on this, Tommy. Uh, well, actually, uh, I would say that customer due diligence should be uh, conducted when or where you know, the customer intends to, you know, uh, proceed with the transaction. Uh, viewing, well, not, not necessary, but where upon uh, they start giving you details for, okay, yes, I want to buy this property, sort out the documentation, I'll give you my information. That's where, you know, customer due diligence uh, begin. And when, if or when, upon, during verification uh, red flags, uh, then, that's where you know the other sorts of uh, considerations must be taken into account. Uh, yes, so, so to answer the question, no viewing is not necessary because they're just there to look at the property, not to enter into any transactions yet. Okay, while we're on the topic, uh, for our last question of the day, uh, Tommy, is CDD basically KYC, and how do you distinguish the two procedures if there are any? Right, I think Sandra has mentioned it. Answering the previous question, yes, uh, 
you know, CAD procedure and KYC procedure is essentially the same thing, just a different term for uh, well, customer due diligence is CD, know your client is KYC. Ultimately, both procedures or both terms, you know, you're getting everything, everything on paper or information or on the customer uh, to be known to you. So yeah, it is the same thing. <laughs> just to so, add, um, the difference, uh, some people actually, because CDD and KYC are used interchangeably, um, the one thing which is not used interchangeably though is customer due diligence is an ongoing process. Uh, K KYC is not. So for CDDs, um, if you have a client, which say, for example, I'll give uh, our law firm as an example, where you have clients for a long period of time, it is uh, good practice to continuously do your due diligence to ensure that their company corporation documents or the information hasn't changed or the IC particulars haven't changed. And that is considered an ongoing CDD. Um, KYCs is slightly different in that manner, but the two have been used very interchangeably. Um, as long as it, people know that it's good practice for CDDs to be done on a continuing basis. And I think that's all from me. Okay. All right. Um, that's the end of our Q&A session for today. Um, thank you for, uh, thank you Tommy and Cassandra for your insights. Before we conclude, I have a few announcements to make. First, please join us again for our upcoming talks. On the 28th of October, our partner, Ms. Leslie Lim, will speak on intellectual properties, protection through trademarks. Secondly, please fill in our feedback form and tell us what you thought of our talks. The link to the form will be posted in the chat. Thirdly, please do follow or like our social media accounts. Fourthly, if you'd like to speak with our lawyers, we offer a complimentary 30 minutes consultation over the telephone or over video conference. Please fill in the form on our website. The link is also posted in the chat. Thank you, everybody. We hope you have found today's session informative and useful. We hope to see you at our next talk. Stay safe, practice physical distancing, and have a great day. And thanks very much, Suen, for being our moderator for today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye.